Okay, so this is the lecture. Um, it's also, we're still in chapter 16, but now we're talking about the um, Romans, the ancient Romans, and then we're going to talk about um, European church architecture, the Romanesque style. Let me go to a different desk here. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm recording this lecture um, not live as I usually do with an audience, but because I'm going to be busy tomorrow morning at the usual time, so I'm just um, doing it ahead of time. And Cody's here. Yeah, Cody's here. Okay. So, um, again, we're still in chapter 16. We're going to be talking about the Romans, and uh, then we're going to skip a lot of centuries and just go to European Romanesque or Roman-like architecture. Um, but I'll, I'll explain all that. All right, so first, um, my, find my PowerPoint here. Okay. Oops, wrong one. Sorry about that. This is the one I want. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. All right. So last week. Um, I was telling you about the ancient Greeks, and um, we can still see Greece on this map right here, but the rest of the uh, colored in area is what the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire sort of took over from Greek civilization, you could say, when Greek civilization, which the Greeks kind of dominated this area in the Hellenistic period, but at the same time, Rome was sort of growing as a power in the Mediterranean. And pretty soon, uh, the Romans and their empire covered most of Europe and a, a lot of the Middle East and North Africa at its height. So um, the Romans, uh, in some ways, they were they were big admirers of the ancient Greeks. They loved their sculpture and other aspects of their art, but we're going to talk about the unique contributions that the Romans made to architecture. And, um, I mean, they, they also had frescoes and sculpture and all of that, but we're going to talk about architecture for the next week. Okay, so we know, you remember that Greek architecture involved the post and lintel system, you could say. So this is the post on a Greek temple, and this is the lintel that the posts support. And, and this style of architecture is beautiful, certainly, but it, it, it kind of, uh, the interior space is constrained by the necessity of having these columns that support the lintels. And what the Romans did was they found a way to get around that, you could say, through the invention of concrete. So it may be hard to imagine that there was a time when concrete didn't exist, but the Romans actually invented it. So what is concrete? Concrete is a mixture of a, an aggregate, usually little rocks or pebbles or something, um, and slaked lime, a sort of cooked lime, you could say. And for the Romans, a special volcanic sand that made very strong uh, cement and concrete. And... They, were, they learned to pour concrete over a form, a wooden form, and in that way they were able to open up the interior of architectural spaces. This is the Pantheon, which we're going to learn a little more about 
later. But you can see that there, yes, there are columns here, but the columns are not really structural. They're decorative. <laughs> and the interior of the Pantheon is, there's this huge interior space um, that's like 100, almost 150 feet across and 150 feet tall. You could fit a big balloon in there. And this kind of interior space was not really possible until the invention of concrete by the Romans. The other thing that they figured out was the way to construct what's called the true arch. Okay, so there were arches before the Romans, but they were what we call corbelled arches. So they were laid up um, like this, and then when you got to the top, you just kind of fudged it here. <laughs> <laughs> and hoped that it stood up. But the Romans discovered that if you actually cut what's called a keystone and inserted it here at the very top of the arch, that the arch would probably stay up a lot longer. <laughs> so that, that little innovation of the keystone and the what are called the voussoirs later, these other shaped wedge, wedge shaped blocks at the top of the arch, um, that plus concrete were the two innovations that kind of sparked this huge building spree on the part of the Romans in all those uh, cities that they conquered around the Mediterranean and other parts of Europe. So the, the, again, knowing how to make a, a true arch with a keystone and knowing how to pour concrete made it possible for the Romans to construct a variety of innovative structures. So first of all, if you make a string, uh, if you stick a bunch of arches together, what you have is called a barrel vault. <laughs> so this is a barrel vault. If two barrel vaults intersect at a right angle, it's a groin vault. If you have a sequence of groin vaults like here then it's called then it's fenestrated that is the top of the arches are can become windows and let light in and then you can also if you sort of arrange your arches in, in a circle so to speak then you have a dome with an oculus so um all these structures were used by the romans in Roman cities around Europe and the Mediterranean. So if you go to Rome now as a tourist and you get on one of the tourist buses, one of the first places that you'll end up is the Colosseum. So the Colosseum was basically a sports stadium. It was arranged in, in a hemisphere, well, actually a sphere, um, like a modern football stadium or baseball stadium. The Greeks built stadiums too for theater, but they were, they built them on the side of a hill, sort of like a half, half of a, a stadium. And, and they used natural existing hills to build their theaters. The Romans could build one anywhere. Concrete was pretty much, was pretty quick to build with compared to marble, the, the marble that the Greeks used, for example. So this is a model of what the Colosseum looked like, you know, when it was new. It, it's a ruin now, so a lot of it is gone. <laughs> but it was originally basically like a modern sports stadium. So when you go to the Colosseum now, what, what you see is the, the concrete structure that was the basis of the Colosseum. The Colosseum was decorated with marble seats and all kinds of uh, decorations on the outside, but the basic underlying structure was this really thick concrete that was poured into wooden forms, and then once it dried, the forms were taken away. So when you go there now, that's what you see, is the concrete bones of the Colosseum. So originally, the Colosseum had a wooden floor across this area, 
now you just see the uh, sort of cages where the animals were kept underneath the floor. Whoops. And sawdust was on that floor to basically, it's, uh, so, I'm sorry to say this, but the purpose of the sawdust was to soak up blood because there was a lot of blood. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So you can see how thick the concrete was to hold up all these levels of the Colosseum. And, and again, these seats here were made out of marble. And this is where the senators, the Roman senators sat. Um, and, you know, the emperor when he was there. And then the next row of seats was for... Uh, citizens of Rome and then the top level was for slaves and women so you can ponder what that might mean <laughs> okay but this is what you see when you go there now I, I went there in 1972 and I just kind of thought man this is kind of ugly <laughs> but it was once beautiful and impressive but the stuff that went on at the Colosseum I, I think most people would not consider it to be beautiful. It was pretty, pretty gruesome, really. So they kept animals in cages down below the level of the floor of the, of the Colosseum, and, and they were brought up, the cages were raised by, you know, a mechanism, and then suddenly the lion would just be there, and these gladiators would have to fight these lions. Sometimes, um, prisoners, people who had been condemned to death, would have to uh, deal with the lions. And that was considered entertainment, to watch a lion kill a condemned prisoner. So, uh, yeah, pretty pretty bad. So, the, the entertainment at the Colosseum consisted of sort of three... Oops, let me turn off my time just a minute. Okay, so you had a chance to <laughs> sort of consider this somewhat disturbing picture. Okay, so the entertainment at the Coliseum, there were sort of three parts to it every day. In the morning, there was something called the Venatio, which was an animal hunt. So the Romans brought wild animals from all over Europe and North Africa and the Middle East and slaughtered them at the Coliseum, again, for the entertainment of the Romans. In the middle of the day, they would execute criminals in different ways, sometimes by feeding them to wild animals, sometimes by having gladiators kill them. And then in the very end of the day, the, the, the show everybody was waiting for was the gladiatorial combat. So the gladiators were slaves. They were owned by Roman citizens. And they were trained to fight each other, and um, in you know this is this is not this is a painting from the 19th century of a person's um, like this painting's maybe a hundred years old of some artist's idea of what the gladiatorial combat might have looked like in Roman times. So this is not a painting from the Roman times. Okay, it's just an imagine imagined scene where one gladiator has defeated another gladiator and he's kind of asking the people in the stands whether they should he should execute this guy or not just finish him off so you know it's kind of I think it's disturbing to a lot of people to think that the um, Romans enjoyed this type of entertainment and I was talking about that one day in my in-person class and, and I said you know I think most people now would not enjoy this kind of entertainment you know they want they like their violence to be fictional <laughs> in a movie and most people in the class disagreed and said oh no cage fighting is just like this cage fighting is people die in cage fights <laughs> and I was like okay I don't know much about cage fighting but if you say so so the Romans were into it <laughs> Uh, 
I don't know what that says about them, but um, in some ways they were not nice people. But their architecture was amazing. Okay, now we're looking at another concrete building, the Pantheon. Don't confuse this with the Parthenon in Athens. This is in Rome. <laughs> and the Pantheon was built, you know, 300 years later after the Parthenon. And you can see that it's influenced by Greek architecture, the whole idea of the columns, the the triangle-shaped pediment, and there were originally decorations here that have been removed. Um, and the columns are huge. They're not stacked slices of marble like at the Parthenon. These are, are each one is a big piece of stone brought all the way from Egypt, which was at that point part of the Roman Empire. So when you approach the Pantheon, it looks like a Greek temple, kind of. Um, and maybe that's what you expect that you're going to see when you get in there, but what you see is entirely different. Because when you enter through the uh, facade here that looks like a Greek temple, once you're inside, you're inside basically a sphere, a perfect sphere. So the distance from the, the oculus, this open window at the top and the floor is 142 feet and the diameter from here to here is also 142 feet. So if you had a, a big balloon or a beach ball that was 142 feet in diameter, it would fit inside the Pantheon. And the Pantheon is made out of concrete. Now this is pretty incredible, really, because concrete is heavy, right? And there's nothing there's no columns holding up this heavy dome. So how did they do it? Well, they had some tricks. <laughs> so this is, I'll tell you about the tricks in a minute. So this is the Pantheon in plan. That is, if you look, we're looking at it from the sky, looking down on the interior of it, it would look like this. And this is the, what's called the elevation, the view from the side. And this is a model. So originally, when you in in Roman times, when you approached the Pantheon, you didn't see this barrel, this concrete barrel behind the the um, sort of Greek temple-like facade. And so you because you were in because there was this uh, arcade here and a wall that created a sort of courtyard that prevented you from seeing the the vault behind so it would be that much more surprising in in roman times when you entered into this vast space okay so here's the part where i talk about how they did it all right so this is how uh art historians think that the Romans accomplished this, this amazing feat of this vault that seems like it should be too heavy to stand up without support. But what they what they think happened was that it was poured in layers. So there's a, there was a form, a wooden form underneath here that um, the concrete was poured on top of. And as they got closer to the top, they lightened the mix by using, instead of using pebbles as the aggregate in the mix, they used a type of stone called pumice, a kind of lightweight stone, a volcanic stone that had a lot of little holes in it, air holes. <laughs> so that type of pebble is lighter and that made the mix, the concrete mix, lighter. And then the fact that the oculus was at the top. Let me move my little thumbnail so you can see the oculus a little better. The oculus doesn't have glass, okay? It's just an open hole. So that lightens the weight of the vault also. And if we go back to, to this picture, you can see what are called coffers, these little indentations or fairly large indentations in the interior of the dome created by the mold that they put the concrete on top of. So that also lightened the weight of the vault. 
and it's thicker towards the bottom but as it goes up here it gets thinner the the mix gets lighter and then there's the oculus there so the whole the whole thing stay stay has stayed up for 2000 years so this is a an again a print or an engraving of a 19th century artist's impression of what it would be like to go inside the Pantheon in the 19th century. So one of, and I, I went into the Pantheon when I visited Rome in 1972, and I was very impressed by the Pantheon. I wasn't so impressed by the Colosseum, but I loved the Pantheon. First of all, I loved it that there was no glass here. So when it rains, water just comes in and falls on the floor but there's a drain here and it just drains away <laughs> so it's okay the other thing i really liked was that this this uh the oculus casts a circle of light onto the onto the walls and floor of the pantheon and this circle of light moves around the room during the day like in the summertime when the sun is right overhead the circle is of light is on the floor and then it moves up the other side the other side of the wall so this might be you know 10 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon when the when the um, circle has moved a little ways up the wall and there's really no other light in the Pantheon other than the light from the oculus and there's a grill over the door that lets a little bit of light in but it's just a beautiful space and it's lavishly decorated on the inside with marble, different colors of marble and um, these columns that are, not, again, they're not really structural. And then statues uh, originally of Roman emperors. So Pantheon means all the gods. So it's a temple to all the gods, all the Roman gods, but eventually the, 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 emperors of Rome were sort of deified. So they were like gods. And there were uh, statues of emperors in here. So one reason that the interior of the Pantheon is pretty well preserved is because it, it became a, a Catholic church. And, that, and it still is used that way um, nowadays. So a certain section of it has you know some seats there and an altar and a little sort of apse there where um, church services can be held and so you can see all this um, lavish decoration from colored marble from all over the Roman Empire the exterior has been kind of stripped of a lot of its original decorations um, now there's a video in the in the online content that you should watch about the Pantheon. Um, we're not going to watch it during this lecture because I think it makes more sense for you just to watch that on your own, and you, you can get a, a a little more information about the Pantheon and a sense of what it's like to be inside it from that video. Okay, so one more. Roman building before we move on to the Romanesque period in Europe. So, um, the, again, the Romans were great at building with concrete. Concrete was cheap to build with, it was fast to build with, and they built a lot. Um, a lot of cities, not just Rome itself, but cities all over Europe and the Mediterranean. But this building that we're going to talk about now, the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine, was a truly enormous building that became very influential later to Christian church builders. So, but it was not a Christian church originally. Okay, the Romans. This uh, eventually Constantine did convert to Christianity and made Christianity legal. But this building, the Basilica, was more like a courthouse. It was, it was a place where tribunals were held, that is, hearings, court, legal hearings. And at one end of it, at the apse here, 
was this colossal statue of the Emperor Constantine. How colossal was it? Well, you can see that these little dots here are people. <laughs> and all that survives is of this colossal statue is a hand and a head, and they are enormous. So this was a huge building built out of concrete, and again, lavishly decorated with colored marbles and so on. Marble, different colors of marble. Okay, so, but what's important about this basilica is, is its plan, kind of, like what you, what you, uh, the plan of any building is what you see from above, if you were looking down into the building. So all a, a Roman basilica, whether it's the Basilica of Constantine or any other basilica that they built, had certain basic parts. It had an apse, usually at the east end, which is a sort of uh, half circle area there. And again, you know, uh, in the original one, there was a, a colossal statue of Constantine there. And then there was the center um, portion which is called the nave, and then the aisles, a i s l e, just like a, a and this is became the model of a Christian church. So if you go to a kind of traditional church, not not a mega church that looks like a, a theater, but a, a traditional church, this is the form that it takes. Right there's a there's a central portion part where most of the seating is and then there's aisles on either side and then this sort of area that you enter when you first come into the church is sometimes called the narthex so again here's a model of what this basilica once looked like when um, when it was new you can see these how big it is by seeing the tiny little figures here they're dwarfed by this space and you can see the the groin vaults here and the fenestrated groin vaults that let in light. So the the ceiling of this thing is also made out of concrete. The walls are made out of concrete. The ceiling is made out of concrete and then it's covered with a a sort of a a, a roof. Again, and this is a, a digital model of what maybe it would have looked like when you were inside it 2,000 years ago. So it's very elaborate, very colorful, very expensive. <laughs> the Romans liked things to be kind of uh, impressive and uh, even a little bit garish, I think. All right, so, so let's just sort of... Um, review a little bit these these and make sure we've got all these buildings straight so here's the Parthenon in Athens Greece made out of marble made around 450 BCE by the by the in the high classical period by the ancient Greeks then here is these are this is the front view of the Pantheon and the interior of the Pantheon built by the Romans out of concrete. So the Pantheon's made out of concrete. The Parthenon is made out of marble. Okay, so that was sort of our whirlwind tour of Roman architecture. And you, but you can, on your own, you can find out a lot more about that in the, in the content. Okay, so now I'm going to open my PowerPoint about, um, about Romanesque church, Christian church architecture in Europe. So that's the next topic. Let's see. Oops. Uh-oh, I made a little mistake. Um. Okay, I have to, sorry for the delay here, but I accidentally closed the other PowerPoint that I want.
Okay, so it's one thing that a lot of people kind of get mixed up about in this course is the difference between Roman architecture and Romanesque architecture. And it is a little confusing. Um, so what is the difference? Roman, this is Roman architecture, okay? It's a, what's called an aqueduct. And the, a lot of, when the, Ro, eventually the Roman Empire kind of collapsed in Europe, France, England, Germany, Italy. Well, um, maybe they still sort of had a hold out in Rome itself. But barbarian invasions and various other problems that the Roman Empire had eventually ca caused it to collapse and, and caused the Romans themselves to go back to Rome, back to Italy. And they left all these structures in England and France and Spain. And you can still see these Roman structures there when you when you go to those European countries. And one of the structures that still exist is this aqueduct. What's an aqueduct? Well, an aqueduct literally means a water uh, pipe or a water leader, you could say. So what it does is it brings water down from the mountains, from a spring in the mountains, to a city. So this is another example of amazing engineering on the part of the Romans that they were able to build these structures that they could build a city anywhere because if, if it didn't have the water supply that they needed or wanted, they would just build an aqueduct and just bring the water from somewhere else to, so that they could have their Roman baths and fountains and all that stuff that they have. If you go to Rome now, the fountains are very impressive. So, um, and these, and you can see that the, the aqueducts, they utilize this technology of the true arch to create these stone aqueducts with concrete mortar that have lasted for 2,000 years. So it's still there. It's still kind of beautiful. And we talked about this technology that they were that the Romans used. So after the Romans left Europe, and we're going to be talking about mainly France um, in this lecture, it it was pretty chaotic for a while because they left a kind of power vacuum, and there was a lot lot there was a kind of peace, what's called the Pax Romana, <laughs> as long as the Romans were in. Europe, but as soon as they left and went back to Rome down here, um, you know, the local warlords just started fighting amongst themselves. And there was a period in Europe that's sometimes called the Dark Ages between the time the Romans left around, I guess, around 400 AD, 300 or 400 AD, and the period that we're talking about today, which begins around the year 1000. But eventually, uh, a kind of peace in the what's in the what we call the 11th century or the 1000 era began that enabled. And by this time, Europe had been Christianized, so there was this sort of explosion of church building, and not just any churches like big whopper mega churches expensive the original mega churches you could say so the every uh black dot on this map is is a, is a famous cathedral in europe but we're mainly going to be focusing on again french um french church architecture beginning with the Romanesque style. So Romanesque just means Roman-like or based on the Roman arch and the Roman um, basilica. So recall that the basilica had a nave, it had aisles, it had an apse, it had what's called a clear story here that let light in. Now, by the time, and so the early Christians copied this 
plan basically for their for their churches. But they add and there there are two main differences. One is the technology of building with concrete had been lost by this time. By the end of the dark ages in Europe, nobody knew how to make those concrete barrel vaults that the Romans could make. Sure, they had mortar, you know, to sort of glue stones together, but they didn't have, they couldn't, they couldn't pour concrete the way that the Romans had. But that was okay. That didn't stop them. You know, they built some amazing things that you're going to see in a minute. But the other difference is that in addition to the nave, the aisles, the apse, and the narthex, which were all part of the Roman basilica, the um, 11th century Europeans added a transept. They want a lot of these cathedrals are built in the shape of a cross, essentially because, you know, they've become Christians. Europe has become Christian. And then they also added chapels around the, these little polyp-like things are actually little chapels that are, that were attached to the apse end of the cathedral. So what were those little chapels for? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. They also added what's sometimes called the west work. So the apse was always at the east end of the cathedral and the entrance, one of the entrances, would be at the west end. So Europeans began adding towers to the western end of the of their cathedrals. Um, like this one in Germany, I think. Okay, so why, what caused this explosion of church, fancy church building? Part of it was just a new peace and prosperity around its beginning in the year 1000, 1100, and around there. But the other driver of it was the whole tradition of pilgrimage. So what is a pilgrimage? A pilgrimage that these these cathedrals all had what what were called relics, and the relics were kept inside a reliquary. This is this is a fancy gold box that held a relic. So what is a relic? A relic is a little magical piece of a saint, maybe a finger bone, maybe a little bit of hair, maybe a little piece of clothing from the saint. Some, some cathedrals claim to have a piece of the true cross. So, you know, you had to have that. You had, you had to have some kind of a relic to make people come to your church. And so what pilgrims did was they traveled along certain pilgrimage routes, going to cathedrals in, in all these cities along the route, and praying to the relics at each cathedral. And the ultimate pilgrimage would be to go all the way to the coast of Spain here at Santiago de Compostela, which is a big pilgrimage church. That was sort of the ultimate trip. But a lot of people made shorter trips to just to cathedrals in France. So again, these precious relics were kept in fancy containers. This is a gold um, figure seated on a kind of a throne. I think it's supposed to be saint Foy, and it contains some piece of his body. You know, he was a martyr of some sort. So it, it, it's a really weird part of medieval Christianity that it's hard to relate, for us to relate to. But these relics were kept in these apsidal chapels here so that you as a pilgrim could enter through a side door and walk around what's called the ambulatory, this area that went back here, and then you could stop at each one of these little chapels and, you know, pray to the saint, light a candle to the saint. <laughs> these churches, you didn't have to pay admission to get in. Um, they were like free art museums, really, but these towns um, 
still wanted people to come and spend money in the town. You know, it was a, the the cathedral with its relics was a huge tourist attraction, you could say. And around the cathedral, there were all sorts of ways to part you from your money, I'm sure. You know, you had to buy a meal, maybe you had to spend the night, maybe you bought a souvenir that proved you'd been there. Um, but the churches themselves did not charge admission. Okay, so what were these, and, and, and they were different also from churches today in that there was no, there were no seats. These had been added later to this very old church in France. But originally there were no pews. People just stood up to go to Mass, and Mass was celebrated every day. There was only one kind of Christian church in Europe at this time. There were not Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, and all that. There was just one church, and it was basically what we would call Catholic. So every day, um, the priest celebrated Mass in Latin at an altar where the transept crosses the nave and if you wanted to go to mass you just stood up here and listened to him sp speak latin probably didn't know what he was saying <laughs> but maybe it made you feel good to be there i don't know okay so you can see how heavy and thick the walls of these churches were they were made out of stone not concrete and the arch, but the arches had that same round shape that the Roman basilica arches had. And basically it's the same layout. There's a nave, there's aisles on either side, and then there's what's called a gallery here, a second floor. Um, there's sometimes there's a staircase going up to this second floor gallery. And then what at the top, what's called the clear story, where there's a few windows that let a little bit of light in. And originally, these Romanesque-style churches had wooden roofs, like this very old one has a wooden roof. Sometimes This particular one, Saint Etienne, does not have a transept, weirdly. But it has everything else, the ambulatory and the, and the apse chapels. So... Because the the uh, walls were so thick, these because the arches, the Romanesque barrel vault made out of stone was so thick, it in heavy it exerted a strong outward and downward thrust, and that had to be supported by these very thick walls and piers. So the result was not a whole lot of light could get in these churches. The windows had to be relatively small. So um, the style of the Romanesque church basically is that it has rounded arches like the Roman arches. It has very thick heavy walls and it has all these chapels that hold the relics of various saints. Now you can see it saint Cernin in France, they kind of went crazy with the apsidal chapels. They don't, they're not even, they're not only around the apse here, but they're also on the arms of the transept. So when you, as a pilgrim, when, and you can see how big this building is. Look how teeny the cars are compared to it. So when you go in the, um, this would be the south entrance. When you go in the south entrance, you, you can go in here and circulate around the ambulatory, look at all the relics, and then exit over here without disturbing the mass that may be going on um, in the transept here. So this is a, a plan of Saint-Sernin. And you can see how, the, at, where is this Saint-Sernin? It's in Toulouse, I think. Let's see. I'm not really sure where it, where it is. Anyway, um, saint Cernin is a very impressive <laughs> Romanesque church. It has a double, double aisles. It has the nave, of course, the crossing where the transept crosses the nave, and this is where the altar would be, where the priest says mass. And then the ambulatory, 
behind this area is called the choir so you can walk behind there and exit here um, and and there's not five six seven, there's nine uh, side chapels presumably with nine sets of relics <laughs> so this would this would be a really important destination if you were an ambitious pilgrim to see all nine relics at Saint-Sernat. Okay, so by by the time Saint-Sernat was built, they were no longer building wooden roofs. Um, the wooden roofs were fire, a fire hazard. <laughs> Instead, they were building stone barrel vaults. Now, you know that the Romans could build concrete barrel vaults, but Europeans in the uh, early 11th century were not using concrete anymore. They didn't know how to do that. They were using stone instead to build these barrel vaults, which were less um, prone to catching on fire. But to, you can imagine the weight of all this stone, right? It had to be held up by enormously heavy piers to support the weight of this and heavy walls to support the outward thrust of these uh, stone barrel vaults. So the walls of a Romanesque cathedral are thick and they're buttressed with big piers. So these are the piers that support the um, heavy stone barrel vault on the interior of Saint-Sernat. And then that barrel vault is covered with a, a metal roof on a, on a Romanesque and on a Gothic cathedral, which we'll get to on Wednesday. Okay, so let's just look at this. This, this sort of breaks it down. This is, these are the elevations. So the, the elevation in an architectural plan is the side view. The plan is the bird's eye view, right? And then this is, the elevation is the wall, basically. So when you're looking at a, a Romanesque church, sort of in cut, cut away like this, you see that it has three levels. It has the nave level, which is where you, go, you stand when you're attending the Mass, and some heavy uh, columns that support the... Uh, barrel vault, which isn't really in this picture, but it's there. And then you have the, the second level, which is sometimes called the gallery or the triforium, and then the clear story level that lets in light. And on the uh, interior, you, this is what you would see. If you're standing in the nave looking at the interior wall, you might see a small aisle window on the ground floor and then you'd see the the arcade and then you'd see the little clear story window so not a lot of light comes in here and then this is what you would see on the outside okay so not only um, was the architecture of the Romanesque cathedral innovative in a way you could say it was the first international architectural style of Europe after the Romans, you could say, after the Romans left. But there was also an elaborate sculptural program on these um, Romanesque cathedrals in the tympanum. Now this is just a diagram so that sculpture is missing, but we're going to see one in just a minute. So the doors, called portals, <laughs> were often elaborately decorated especially the tympanum. So there'd be a whole story here in the tympanum over the door when you entered the church. So this is the one at Vézelay. Now there's a, a video in the content that goes into a lot of detail about this amazing tympanum. Um, but I'm just going to kind of tell you the basics of what's going on here. Okay, so this, this is Jesus in the middle here. So one thing to be thinking about is the difference between this Christian medieval, Middle Ages, 
Christian sculpture and the sculpture of the ancient Greeks, it's terribly, it's completely different, right? There's very little nudity for one thing. <laughs> the, most of the people have clothes on and it's not very naturalistic. This is not a realistic proportional man, right? It's a, it's, the head is too small. The limbs are very thin. It, it it's, the hands are huge. I mean, it's not about trying to make a realistic representation of a human man. Um, it's about, it's, it's more about, uh, the sort of symbolic meaning of the figure and the iconography of the figure and the story that's being told here and the swirls in the drapery are also really important but but anyway here's Jesus and what it what it is is he's giving the mission to the apostles these are the apostles on either side of him and there's kind of rays of light streaming from his hands to their heads so some people say it's also the Pentecost, that is the fire of the Pentecost that gave them the ability to speak in tongues. So there's sort of two stories overlapping here. But basically Jesus is telling the apostles to go out and Christianize the rest of the world, to preach the gospel to the rest of the world. So they're all carrying books, you know, the books of the New Testament. And then in the lentil here, and in the archivolts around the tympanum are the people that in different parts of the world that the apostles are supposed to Christianize. And again, it's not realistic. The, the, the humans portrayed in these um, medieval sculptures are not at all like classical Greek sculpture, but they have their own kind of, charm <laughs> so um give them a chance they may look kind of weird but um and clunky a little bit compared to the greeks but they have their own beauty i think and we'll see that especially on wednesday when we look at the cathedral of chart and you know like the greek sculptures on the parthenon and elsewhere the sculpture at on Christian churches, medieval churches, was brightly painted. The intent was to tell a story, tell a Bible story to illiterate European peasants and kind of teach them what, you know, the stories of the Bible to people who couldn't read. And at any rate, the Bible was only in Latin at this point. So even if you could read, you'd, you'd have to be able to read Latin to to read the Bible. So most people couldn't read the Bible. So um, they learned the stories of their faith from the art on, on the cathedral, the sculpture, the stained glass, and so on. Okay, so just to kind of, here's the figure of Jesus again. And you can see when, when in the video, they sort of zoom in on some of these patterns, these swirly patterns on his drapery that are really incredible and that copy the uh, style with which manuscript, uh, medieval manuscripts were illustrated. There's a lot of this swirly business going on in the, in drawing and painting of that period too. And then you can see that, um, Oops, I'm running out of battery. Um, Jesus has a kind of whole body halo here that's called a mandorla. So I, I really encourage you to watch that video and um, learn about this, a little bit about this, the sculpture at Vesley. So let's just, so the point that you want to, um, the main point of the lecture today is just that Europeans took the basilica form, the basilica plan of the Romans, and they Christianized it to make the, uh, a, the Romanesque style church. That means Roman-like. But the Romans were gone by this time. They didn't build these Romanesque churches. The Celts and the Franks and <laughs> the Britons <laughs> built these churches 
uh, basically our ancestors after the conquerors the the mean Romans went home and we were just kind of left to our own devices we fought each other for 400 years or 500 years and then finally went okay let's build some churches <laughs> oh wait we forgot how to make concrete oh well no no worries we'll just use stone so that's how it went down so um, check out the content um, in your eLearn course and watch the videos near the top of the content and I think you'll you'll be good for the midterm test and we'll we'll talk about that some more on at the zoom discussion on Friday so that's all bye